Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 30, we're going to take a look at vintage vacuum tubes and why they sound so much better than reissues. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Okay, what in the heck is a vintage tube and why do they consistently sound better than most new tubes made today? So to answer those questions, we need to take a quick look at the history of the vacuum tube. Way back in 1904, John Ambrose Fleming invented the first vacuum tube, a simple diode. Three years later, in 1907, Lee DeForest invented the three-terminal audion tube. And in 1914, seven years later, Eric Tigerstad, hopefully I said that right, I believe he was Finnish, uh, he came up with the idea of a concentric cylinder with the cathode at the center. And we'll look at some of those in a minute. But what I really want to talk about is the different eras of tubes. So the golden age of radio was from about 1920 to about 1950. And I'm going to call that the first tube era. During the Second World War, 1940 to 45 roughly, saw significant technological developments in tubes. And then in the 1950s, the same thing happened again when television was invented and became very common. So the second or modern tube era, in my opinion, started about 1940 to about 1982-ish. And sadly, in 1982, the Mullard Blackburn plant closed. The Blackburn plant produced some of the best vacuum tubes in the world, and it was one of the largest plants in the world as well. And so ended um, many of the plants actually closed in those years. But some of them kept on going. And many of those plants were in Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and in China. And the reason for that is because their militaries had a lot of tube equipment that needed replacement tubes, and they were slower to adopt newer technology, the transistor, and throw away, if they had a good sounding tabletop radio or console, why would you throw it away if it sounded good? But they needed tubes, so they would keep on making tubes, of course. And then from about 2000 today, something happened, and the third tube era started. And I think it was substantially fueled by the audio enthusiasts who rediscovered the wonderful sound of tube. And um, that's just continuing. Um, people are jumping in into tubes like crazy and putting a lot of pressure on uh, the inventory of vintage tubes. And unfortunately, the, the price uh, across the board for vintage tubes seems to be going up every day. And of course, availability, <laughs> availability is going down. Sometimes it's a struggle to keep certain tubes in stock. And one thing I should mention is that during this era, when most of the plants were closing, uh, musicians uh, still kept their equipment. Uh, so a lot of people had uh, tube amplification, professional musicians and amateurs as well, and they loved the sound. Um, there's nothing like the sound of um, a tube guitar amplifier. And they, they needed replacement tubes, so they, they kept um, the remaining plants going. That and uh, legacy equipment and militaries. Okay, enough of the history. Let's take a look at some of the tubes. So, in the first era, the golden age of radio, we had something called direct heated triodes. This is a number 45 globe tube. Not hard to see why they called it that. And a direct heated triode only had four pins. So, how the heck do you get a pin, you know, a tube to run in four when, you know, in a standard power tube uh, today would be an octo with eight pins. Maybe we don't need all eight, but we've got we've got most of those pins doing something. And what's going on here? Well, one of the one of the pins is your plate, your high voltage, 
One of the pins gets the idle signal onto the grid. So that makes two, right? Now, you know, everybody knows that we need two connections to get the heater to light up. That's the other two pins, right? <laughs> what about the cathode? Well, the cathode and the heater are combined. And so that makes for a direct heated uh, triode or a direct heated cathode. And you'll see them in short form. They'll see DHT, same thing. So a little later version with a more modern envelope for the 1940s, let's say, we have the same tube in number 45 in the ST or shoulder tube type. Everybody calls these Coke bottles. This is a lovely Ge General Electric version. And of course, it's got four pins as well. Now, the direct heated triode that you're probably most familiar with is the big monster, the 300B. This is a reissue by Electroharmonix. It's actually quite a nice tube. It's well made. And um, they've, the, in this case, Electroharmonix went to some effort to produce a good, a really good tube. And this was always, the 300B was always an audio tube, but it wasn't for home audio or for movie theaters. This was a telephone amplification tube. Neat, huh? Okay, moving into what I'm going to call the more modern era, we had the invention of a number of higher powered, more compact power tubes. And this is a 6L6. This is a beautiful RCA Coke bottle. Many of the, these tubes in the Coke bottle or ST type glass had coatings, which to, was to reduce interference. And these are beam powered tetrodes, which was a big innovation at the time. A smaller version of the 6L6 is the 6V6. And of course, there's metal versions of each, uh, which would have been for military or industrial applications. Here is a, a much more recent Sylvania 6L6 GC, so a, small, a much smaller envelope, same octal, modern octal pins in which we have a no longer direct heated uh, tube, we have an indirect heated tube, and virtually every tube that anybody uses today is indirectly heated. So we have two separate pins carry the heater, and in the case of um, a power tube, we're going to have one pin for the cathode. And, and the extra pins that you're seeing here are uh, the extra grids that go on to uh, beam powered tetros. At the same time, we saw the invention of the pentode. In fact, the pentode, I believe, just preceded the tetro. They, they came along at roughly the same time, and um, the late 30s and um, and early 40s. And this is a wonderful EL34 or 6CA7. And um, this one was made by Mullard, Philips own Mullard. Um, so sometimes these will have a Philips base and sometimes they'll have the Mullard um, uh, base. And they've got a nice code here. Let me see if you can see the manufacturing code. So the capital B over here tells us it was Blackburn. We just talked about the Blackburn plant. And up here is the series, XF2. So that tells us that this is the 1960s um, Mullard EL34. And these are fabulous tubes. Um, they just sound absolutely wonderful. The mid-range is to die for. And almost as a hobby, I, I collect and assemble quads. And I call it a hobby because you can't make any money doing that. <laughs> it costs so much. To, I find these tubes one, two at a time around the world. I bring them in and then I have to match them up and it takes a lot of tubes to match up a quad, a vintage quad, let me tell you. Uh, but it's fun. It's very rewarding. It's lovely to get a quad together. In fact, I just shipped a quad off to um, a really great customer who, who knows, she knows her stuff. She's in Australia. She knows who she is. I'm hoping she loves that quad as much as I did. And, um, Moving on, we have the smaller tubes, the preamp tubes. So this is actually branded tongue cell, but I believe these offset flat plates tells us that this is an RCA 6SN7. 
This is a, basically a universal voltage amplifier. So it has a gain of about 20. It's used for all kinds of things. It's a twin triode. So that, you see that? There's two tubes inside one envelope. Now the more modern version of this tube is the 12AU7. And it, the 12AU7 essentially took over much of the duty of the 6SN7. And this is a gorgeous Telefunken. And it's rare to find Telefunkens with their lettering intact. Notice I'm not touching the lettering. The lettering was really easy to come off. But we know it's a Telefunken because it has an embossed. You can't see it. It's really tough. Well, maybe you can. There's a flat, boxy kind of a diamond shape embossed into the glass. And none of the counterfeiters have done that, as far as I know. Anyways, this is a fabulous tube. And the higher gain version of the 6SN7 was the 6SL7. This happens to be a Russian melts equivalent. And there is your concentric plates. You see that? Inside the round plate, of course, is a round cathode. And inside of that is your heater elements, right? And if this had a nominal gain of 20, this had a nominal gain of 70. And the tube that really took over much of the duties of the 6SL7 and many other high gain applications is the 12AX7. And of course it has a nine pin miniature. And this is a really nice vintage Sylvania. It's from the end of the tube era. I believe they all date from, 19, I'm not sure if I can see the date on this. I think these had boxes, if I remember rightly. Maybe not. Anyways, I believe these all come from the late, um, late then there were no Sylvania tubes from the late 80s folks I believe this is from the early 80s and here is a miniature uh, beam powered tetro this is a 6pq5 most people know this as an EL84 this is a vintage RCA and um, like the smaller 6v6 to the 6l6 this uh, is essentially a small version of the EL34 and of course, the reason for the requirement for miniaturization is that we wanted to go from um, radios that sat on the floor and required you know, a moving company to move them to tabletop radios, which were more practical. Um, of course, militaries wanted their radios to be uh, more compact and portable. And when TVs were invented, um, they needed uh, smaller tubes. So the 6SN7 envelope, which was started off quite large, got smaller and smaller. Uh, and GE produced a really, and Raytheon produced really uh, small glass envelopes. And the requirement, the reason for that, of course, was to get them to fit into TVs more conveniently and, and to reduce the size of TVs. Because they were, at one time, they were just massive. Okay. And what about the last era of tubes, the reissue era? Here is a Mullard branded Russian uh, new sensor uh, reissue. Now, people call these reissues, but in my opinion, this is a Russian made tube, not a terrible tube, but a Russian made tube. It's made in the old reflector factory in Saratov. I think that's how you say it. And um, New Sensor owns the brand names for a whole bunch of vintage tubes. Uh, Mullard, um, Gold Lion, um, what are the other ones? Tungsol. Uh, you probably know uh, New Sensor tubes by um, Electroharmonix. That was their big brand for a long, long time. And in my opinion, if we compare these tubes, there's virtually no similarities. The glass envelope's not the same size. The micas aren't the same. The plates, look at the original Muller. It has, it's beautifully welded together. And here it's just punched and riveted. Look how, it's not sloppily done, but it's sure not neat like the Muller, let me tell you. And there's no comparison in sound. These, the mid-range of these is just to die for. This is just a rebranding of a tube my opinion. And many of the reissues are like that. Yes, they're commonly available and cheap on Amazon, and you can get them instantly at home in a day or two. <laughs> but have you bought anything close to a vintage sounding tube? No, unfortunately not. Now, interestingly enough, um, 
the EL34 electroharmonics that I believe that many of these later reissues are based upon, same factory, different, made 10, 20 years ago, they sound actually quite good. So I'm not sure what's going on. In fact, um, vintage Russian tubes from the 50s, like the Meltzes, is that a word, Meltzes? <laughs> um, into the 60s and even into the 70s uh, sound really great. Um, so, what's going on here? How come the reissues really don't have a lot of the magic? Some of them are great, don't get me wrong, uh, particularly some of the high-end some of the high-end Russian tubes, uh, the Gold Lion 12AX7, for example, is really quite a lovely tube. It's a premium tube, though. And if you're willing to buy a Russian premium tube or a Chinese premium tube um, and pay a lot of money, a serious money, more than you would pay for, in many cases, a vintage equivalent, uh, you can get a pretty good tube. Um, but what's going on? How come these tubes from the first era and the second or modern era tubes, how come they sound it so good? And here is my theory. I'm just going to put it out there. During the golden era of radio, manufacturers, designers, assemblers of tubes, factories were learning their trade. Literally, it was a radio was a huge thing. When it arrived, people jumped on. As soon as they could afford a radio set, they, they jumped on and they got a radio because it linked your home to the world. And it was just a huge period of, of, um, of development. By the time the Second World War started, we had, um, we had factories, we had designers, we had assemblers, we had material specialists who knew their stuff, who were at the top of their game. And we had a huge demand for tubes during the war. And after the war, we had the introduction of a whole series of innovative designs during the war, the miniature nine pins, the 12AU7, 12AT7, 12AX7 appeared. And from that period, the 1950s through the 1960s, we had all kinds of fabulous factories who knew what they were doing. A lot of that just disappeared around 1982. Many of those people are retired, many of them are gone now. And I believe that we're now, in this third tube era, relearning some of the secrets that made for the magic of those vintage tubes. And I think as time goes on, and there's every indication that this, this explosion in interest in vacuum tube audio is going to continue, um, that we're going to see that the sound quality has improved. In the last few years, particularly the high-end tubes out of China, have shown a lot of promise. And eventually those prices should come down. Okay, now, this was just an overview of audio tubes, just to kind of get a sense for what a vintage tube is and why they sound so good. I, I completely skipped over industrial, commercial, specialized tubes. Most of you will never use a big monster like this. This is a Jan 8613. This is a Thyrotron, <laughs> and, and look at that, it's got a separate plate, it's got four pins in the bottom, a separate plate connection. When you see a separate plate connection, that usually means high voltage, folks. So this is, I believe it is um, a hydrogen-filled tube. It's got a reservoir in here. I'm not sure why. Does hydrogen cool a tube down? Somebody might know and jump on that. Um, but this thing, this rectifier, it can handle 16 kilovolts. <laughs> That's 16,000 volts. Isn't that amazing? And they're actually worth a few bucks. So some, some of these are still in use somewhere. And of course, broadcast was huge, both in radio and in television. And here's a, what was a broadcast tube. This is a, um, a 311. Let's get you on camera, which is actually the same as the 211. Look at the size of that thing. And this is actually, because this is a, um, a direct heated triode, this, this is actually a much loved audio tube today.
As far as I know, they're no longer being used for their original purposes. And with that, let's take a look at what came in this week. A whole, we were talking about a reflector, and a whole bunch of these equivalent 6SL7s came in. And these are all new old stock vintage from, a lot of them are from the 1960s. Uh, and the nice thing about some of the Russian manufacturers is that they give you a good day code with a, um, a month or a week and a year. Fairly clearly marked. A lot of them have survived, especially the new old stock versions, of course. And these, I'm putting these through their, their uh, trial in my R8, which uses them in the, um, in the preamp uh, driver stage. And they're sounding pretty good, and they're very inexpensive. And, oh, a really interesting tube came in. So, many of you know that I'm a huge fan of the Sylvania 6SN7s. And I'm not alone. The Bad Boys from the 1950s are wonderful sounding tubes. But, they have a problem. They're getting very old. They're about 70 years old now. They're, they're the GT, or first version of the 6SN7. So they're a lower spec tube. And they're not doing well in modern equipment. So I don't recommend them anymore. Um, we're just, I'm just losing too many of them. People, people will buy them, they'll be quiet in my equipment, and then within a day they're noisy in, in someone else's equipment. So uh, I've often thought that the GTA version of this tube was the next generation. Now this is the GTA but not with the angle plates. Can you see that? The plates are straight, just like the bad boy. So I'm going to call this the missing link. So how do these 6SN7 GTAs with, this, with the bad boy alignment of the plate, how do they sound? The detail is out of this world. And the sound stage is really nice. They don't have that superb bass of the earlier GTs. They have a nice bass. And the sound signature is very similar to the next generations of Sylvania 6SN7s that are much loved tubes. And I'm not sure how, I, I only had one of these, in, I've handled hundreds of these tubes, if not thousands, and um, I'm not sure what happened, but one of my wholesalers had a bunch of these. I think he was hoarding them. <laughs> and uh, so the word's out now, these are great tubes. Anyways, there's a bunch of them in the store. And along with that purchase came a whole bunch of the more common 6SN7 GTA Sylvanias with the angle plates. In fact, from this time on, Sylvania angled the plate. I am presuming that that had something to do with interference, but maybe it just had something to do with making the tube uh, more efficiently. Um, but the plates are definitely angled uh, RCA would offset their plates, so I think that's a thing, or a technological improvement, or design improvement. Anyways, a lot of these GTAs came in. Most of them have the older version base, the taller base. Um, in fact, the shorter base uh, tubes tended to transition pretty, pretty quickly into the GTBs. All of the Sylvania 6SN7 type tubes, in my opinion, are wonderful tubes. There's some minor differences generation to generation, but they just, they're all around just great tubes. They, they, they don't stand out in any particular way. They just do everything really well. So it's not surprising that a lot of people want these for their new preamps. Okay. Well, if you stayed till the end, Here's some discount codes for you. Remember, I have flat rate $20 shipping around the world. And if your order is $150 or more, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.